Okay, so our next speakers are Dr. A.J. Reisinger and Tina McIntyre to talk about quantifying impacts of fertilizer workshops on nitrogen leaching and subsequent economic impacts in Seminole County. What a mouthful. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. It's a three-minute yellow light. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you all for coming today. And um, I'm Tina McIntyre. Uh, just to start off with a little bit about me. So I actually grew up in Palm City in Martin County, which was ground zero of water quality issues uh, along the St. Lucie River there uh, for a while. And so, you know, water quality is, is something that is near and dear to my heart. And um, I'm very familiar with. <laughs> um, and so when I came to Extension, I had a pretty big background already in water quality. Um, and so really I wanted to do fertilizer education and that was a, a really big push for the county. And so we passed our fertilizer ordinance in 2017 before I started. And, um, but there was a really big emphasis on fertilizer education when I came into the position. Of course, in extension, we want to quantify impacts of our programming. We wanna be able to demonstrate that those programs are important. And so i um, just gonna share with you today a little bit about how we've had our program on fertilizer and also been able to capture some of those impacts. Okay. Okay, so um, this program couldn't have been done without all of our partners. So we did secure a Florida Department of Environmental Protection 319 grant in partnership with our county that was focused specifically on educating residents and professionals uh, about fertilizer and best management practices. That money ultimately came from the Environmental Protection Agency. Of course, we've talked a little bit today already about water quality impairments and Seminole County, of course, is no stranger to that. We are home to the Wakaiva River. Uh, we're just north of Orlando, for those of you that aren't familiar with Seminole County. But essentially, we have the Wakaiva River, which is a wild and scenic national river. We have the St. John's River um, also bordering our county. And we have what we call Oxbow Lakes, which is Lake Jessup. Lake Monroe and lots and lots of surface water there in Central Florida. We have some uh, acronym soup. Most of you are probably somewhat familiar with these. So the total maximum daily loads. We have some basin management action plans around that with Kaiba Springs and um, some other managed areas. So here you can see, like I mentioned, you know, the Wakaiva Springs is a national treasure. If you haven't had a chance to get out there and paddle, it's definitely an experience. And so there's extra designations. In addition to the total maximum daily load, we have a basin management action plan for Wakaiva Springs and um, the river itself. And so, you know, per that designation, that national designation, um, it has to be an outstanding nat natural, cultural, and recreational value in a free flowing condition for the enjoyment of present and future generations. So, um, you know, it's economically and environmentally tied to the area through recreation, property values, wildlife support, and of course, aquifer recharge, but it is impaired for nitrogen and phosphorus. So they've done a lot of research on the Wakaiva River and in the Wakaiva Springs and the Wakaiva Basin. So this is DEP um, research looking at the nitrate loading into the Wakaiva Basin. And you can see that fertilizer does contribute quite a bit um, just in terms of um, fertilizer in general almost makes up 50%, but when we break that out, um, sports turf grass fertilizer is about 8%, urban turf grass fertilizer is about 26%, and then our farm fertilizer is about 11%. So our program specifically was targeting to educate, you know, residents and professionals on that 26%, the urban turf grass fertilizer. So we did this through our fertilizer workshops, which we offered. We started them in September 2018, and we're still offering them today. We have one coming up next month, and uh, we've averaged about offering them twice a month. And of course, COVID and different things over the years 
uh, we were able to hire a, a fertilizer educator to help us support that programming. And um, the data that I'm sharing with you is impacts from through 2020. Uh, 20, and basically we were focusing on those best management practices. And so we have you know, our green industry's best management practices through a floor friendly landscaping program, all those best management practices and really targeting homeowners. And so this, since this was a partnership program, we were able to offer a free bag of floral friendly fertilizer to those residents that wanted to come and that really incentivized them to come. It's difficult to say, hey, come to a fertilizer workshop to residents, um, but that really did bring them in and they were quite interested in that, um, you know, two hour workshop and also getting the free bag of fertilizer. Most of the time we, during the, the period that we were giving out the fertilizer, it was 50% required by our county. Uh, that's also recommended. Um, and so really we, we were giving out a 50%. Since then, the ordinance has raised it to 65% slow release. So we started giving out that 65%, but most of the data we calibrated on that 50% behavior change. We also were able to get our class approved for Florida Department of Agricultural and Consumer Services uh, licensed professionals. So they were getting continued educational units, those CEUs. And um, since it was a two hour class, they were getting two CEUs per, per workshop, which is really great uh, to support their licensure. So a lot of the times, you know, they do need those continuing education. And a lot of the times, you know, we as extension professionals are who they're turning towards to get that, that education. Um, over the course of this time span, we were able to give out 520 fertilizer CEUs to 271 professionals. And since it was grant funded, we were able to, um, you know, really incentivize their in, uh, participation. We also had some great partners who have already been recognized today. Um, we were targeting, again, those people, those licensed professionals with a Florida Department of Agricultural license. And um, we were approved in multiple categories. So of course, those with a fertilizer license, but also those with a pesticide license were able to, to take our classes. We were also approved for FNGLA CEUs. We're grateful for our partnership with them. Um, we did some education as well with the Florida Turfgrass Association. And, um, you know, really through educational seminars, meetings, and webinars. So I did want to show real quick, um, we have some of our PSAs. They're kind of silly, but a lot of those workshops. So these were award winning PSAs that we were able to do. Another one here. We we're trying to get all the demographics. So one of our BMPs for, uh, you know, for Central Florida is to not fertilize during the winter. And, um, you know, we're very grateful to, to partner to be able to do that and, you know, get that marketing out there, but also in conjunction with our workshops. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Reisinger to talk about the impacts. Um, I was basically hounding anybody who would help and he stepped up to the task. So I was very grateful for that. <laughs> Yeah, so oh, I got to be in front of the mic, sorry. So like Tina said, she kind of kept hounding us to figure out how to, she had all this really cool data on behavior change and how residents were taking this awesome fertilizer workshop. And I'm not a behavior change expert. I'm a biogeochemist. I think about nutrient inputs and outputs and mass balances and all kinds of things like that. I'm like, oh, but if we have this change in behavior, that's a change in an input okay, how does that change our outputs? And that's really the impact that we're looking at. And so in order to get to those, those impacts and those changes in outputs, 
uh, I said, like every academic, well, we need to do some research. We need some money to do some studies. The studies take some time and they're ongoing. Thanks, Stacy, for the money that we're working on right now. Um, but in the, in the interim, there's been research done out there. There's studies published in the literature. Let's see what we can do. And so uh, Tina had all this really great behavior change data with the total number of people educated about the BMPs. So, so through those 70 classes offered over about a two year period, there were 2,100 people educated. Um, basically 100% of them increased their knowledge, intended to use the information to fertilize efficiently, were more confident, et cetera. Like the behavior change she was targeting, she achieved those behavior changes. That's awesome. That's, so that's that first step in, in having an impact. But that doesn't really mean a ton if you don't see the environmental effects, if you don't see the economic benefits. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm pretty sure that in every tenure packet related to water quality that I've worked on or read, it says that uh, impacts on water quality are difficult to measure because it takes 20 plus years and it takes everybody kumbaya coming together to change all their habits and you can't really document the impacts of one specific behavior change. I wanted to see if we could do something about that. And Tina came to me with all this awesome data. So we put together this EDIS publication. You can see the title here. Um, you can see the QR code. Um, and we can direct you to it later if you're interested. But we figured out how to quantify the uh, nitrogen benefits and the economic benefits of those behavior changes that she quantified. So what we did is we looked at UF IFAS research uh, from the past 30 years, actually, uh, on nitrogen leaching through uh, residential soils or simulated residential soils. So we had a few specific criteria that we were looking for. We wanted to compare slow release versus quick release or water soluble nitrogen fertilizer, because that was one of the main behavior changes Tino was ta targeting. And we also wanted to compare different um, qualities of landscapes to kind of get a, a, a window of variability uh, some people have a really perfectly maintained yard. Some people have a really crappy maintained yard. In reality, it's mostly in the middle, but we wanted to kind of have those bookends. And so we found a Saha et al. study. Um, that was a column study that measured nitrogen leaching uh, in greenhouses with uh, healthy, well-maintained St. Augustine grass. And this is what we call the low leaching scenario because that St. Augustine grass, just like we've seen in other studies uh, throughout uh, the turf grass team's research, well-maintained, healthy growing St. Augustine grass can suck up a lot of nitrogen, so it's not going to leach very much. But then we also found a study by Wang and Alva down at the Citrus REC um, in the 90s that they applied fertilizer quick release and slow release to just sandy soil, bare soil, no grass or anything on there. So this is just how much absorption capacity does the soil itself have, so that's our high leaching scenario. And then we compared, or then we calculated, sorry, how much nitrogen would leach if somebody went to the store, bought a typical bag of store-bought fertilizer, we looked at the uh, formulations of a variety of fertilizers from Home Depot and Lowe's and other box stores. And we said, okay, based on the high leaching scenario, if you applied five pounds of this, 90% would leach. So this is how much would leach from your yard. Based on the low scenario, 10% would leach. So this is how much would leach from your yard. And so that's if you just went and bought a, a, a bag off the shelf. What about if you went to Tina's fertilizer workshop and got her 50% slow release fertilizer and followed by this recommendations? How does that change that leaching amount? Okay, now what if you follow the, the ordinance in your local county and you don't fertilize that one time in the summer that we recommend outside of a fertilizer ordinance, but we say you can't fertilize in the summer because of this ordinance. How, do, how much does that save you? So we did those calculations. One set of those calculations are shown here. I'm not going to walk you through it. I know tables are ridiculous and really bad uh, to portray visually on a presentation, but I'm just showing you that there is some like some actual uh, guts behind this talk. Like we, we did the math, we did the calculations, and I can talk more about them later. But we also did a follow-up survey and we did some of these assumptions um, and we figured out how much Tina's behavior changes actually benefited her county. We found that by using a 50% or more slow release nitrogen product, the 514 participants that participated in her workshops saved about 79 to almost 1,000 pounds of nitrogen from entering the groundwater in Seminole County. And that equates to an economic benefit of 40,000 to almost $500,000. So that's just from Tina and her workshops. That's not from all of IFAS. That's not, that's Tina and the awesome workshops she's doing and the partnerships she's had. 
In addition, if the people, the 434 people that said that they would follow the fertilizer ordinance restricted periods, that saved another 100 to almost 800 pounds of nitrogen from reaching the aquifer and 50 to $400,000. So this is how we were able to estimate these benefits. Again, I said that this is based off of some laboratory column studies, um, a worst case scenario and a best case scenario. So in reality, we're probably somewhere in the middle, but I think this at least gives a good, does a good job of bracketing the impact that Tina and her program might be having. So ultimately, uh, Tina can, could combine these and say that over that two year period, she saved this much nitrogen and this much uh, dollar amount for the county based on reducing nitrogen in the environment. Um, and like I said, it's due to the wide range of scenarios in the landscape. So to conclude, um, educational efforts did document, did show really significant behavioral changes. Um, and that led to our ability, or we were, we were trying to reduce levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. And we did that by reducing the fertilizer being applied. But just because you stop applying some fertilizer doesn't mean you necessarily are having the economic benefit. Fertilizer by itself isn't bad, right? It's a tool that we use. And so by teaching people how to use it more effectively, we were able to document these really cool behavior changes. Um, oh yeah, and before we finish here, we this is kind of like a little brief mini teaser for uh, in-service training that Tina and I are putting on in June. So if you are a... Uh, county agent, county faculty that is working in the fertilizer realm, we would strongly encourage you to attend this. We will be providing Tina's educational materials. Uh, we'll be walking through the calculations. We'll be talking through Michael Dukes' irrigation savings calculator as well. And we also will have some like example uh, impact statements for your packets and everything. We're hoping to make this as user-friendly and easy, easy for you all to use as possible. So we're not asking you to do any more work. We're just asking you to kind of do a few calculations and build upon the work you're already doing. So with that, uh, thanks to Seminole County and thanks to you all for having us. And I didn't even see a yellow light, so we're ahead of time here. <laughs> so we have plenty of time for questions. And I'll just take some people questions. Yeah, I'm curious, where did you uh, air the advertisements? So they were actually done for us by, uh, the question was, where did we air the advertisements, the PSAs? Um, we were lucky enough to actually go out of the county. Um, historically, the PSAs were done in-house uh, by Seminole TV, but we, were, we had funds to actually hire Channel 6, uh, WKMG in Orlando, to do, you know, produce, they had three or four um, of different, you know, kind of themes. Uh, we had a techno and a couple others we didn't show, but, um, and they, they aired, they're still airing on uh, Channel 6. So they actually, when we paid for them to produce them, we also paid them for the marketing. And so they were able to run on major times, um, not just like on SGTV, you know, the little local uh, seminal TV but actually on channel six and, you know, they have relationships with like channel nine and channel five and, you know, those types of things. So actually was pretty widely um, produced. And then of course, online as well. Yeah. Great. Okay. Hey, Hamuntala, yes. Um, yeah, so she, her question was, did the workshops interface with the GIBMP or Green Industries Best Management Practices Florida Friendly Program? Um, and yes and no. So we do offer GIBMP um, within our district and, you know, within our county. Um, I'm certified to do so, and our, our fertilizer educator is also a, a teacher, a trained teacher, but um, these are really more kind of standalone, and so the GIVMP is great because it certifies them to be able to get their license if they're new. Um, it also offers those CEUs, those continuing educational units to, you know, people who have a license already. But sometimes the people who have a license, you know, would like to learn new things or, or try, you know, new things. And so I think our workshop did help um, with that as well, uh, with some of our clients to be able to, you know, try something different. And so I think we filled that niche as well. Um, 
Um, so the yeah, the content of the workshop was similar, um, but packaged slightly differently, I would say. Um, so obviously the GIVMP materials are very um, set and they're, you know, kind of we coordinate with FDAX and, you know, thankfully the Florida Friendly Program does all that. Um, it's a very strong program. This, obviously, we have more flexibility, um, really, and just working with FDAX to get the CEU approval. But really, we could do a little bit more. So when we were in person, we did integrate a tour of our demonstration landscape to talk more about um, Florida-friendly plants and things like that as well. Um, and then do we want to do one more example? Okay. What percentage of fertilizer is applied by residents versus by professionals? Well, I can tell you that I have worked with a lot of professionals over the years. And when we do get kind of an inquiry or, or you know, kind of obviously our county does more of the enforcement stuff, but we do see um, products that they are using. And typically it is easily 50% to 100% slow release. Most of our industry professionals have access to very high percentages of slow release, very large quantities, things like that. Um, and with the residents, um, you know, now the requirement for the county is 65%. It's even hard to find that um, sometimes at the commercial facilities. That's actually what we're working on now is educating in the retail space and doing retail education, working more with, with our retailers um, and nurseries. And um, yeah, I, I don't know those specific percentages, uh, Cesar, but um, yeah, the, the more research and more information is needed, right? Mm -hmm. Susan? Okay, so um, on the one slide, we have that 514 people were now using the Pacific Percent Slow Release Program. Mm -hmm. So what did you pull that data on what they were using prior to that and then interpret, interpolate the, the nitrogen leaching savings based on what they used before versus after? Yeah, so her question was uh, about the data collection. And so really what we did was we educated the over 2000 people and we did a in, an in-class survey if it was either in-person or online. Um, right after they took the class, they had a, you know, if they learned something or if they intended to change Three to six months later, we followed up with them with a, a follow-up survey. Um, obviously, the numbers will decrease, you know, in terms of how, how much, you know, because they're required to do the survey to get the bag of fertilizer initially. And then the follow-up is just at the good of their heart. And um, in that follow-up survey, we did ask them, um, you know, based on the class. And so when we, when we surveyed them, we say, based on the class, based on attending and, and what you learned in the class, have you changed? And if they were already doing the practice, there was a column in the survey that allowed them to basically say, well, I've you know already been doing this. So we were able to kind of remove them from the data set and then just look at purely based on these classes. And then just to follow up, we, if, if they said that they had changed, we assumed that originally they were buying a typical average box of fertilizer off the shelf, but still following IFAS like moderate level fertilizer recommendations just as a baseline. So like typical, I think like five pounds of nitrogen per, per thousand square feet per year um, with a typical uh, Home Depot bag of fertilizer. Peter, did you want to teach? Just by <laughs> Question. Yeah. Uh, so, what I these are uh, dollar savings rather than formula economy savings because the ACR is reserved for a more broader concept. And I think your impact could be even larger uh, because these are, so these are dollar savings which are direct effects, mm -hmm. but then there could be indirect economic effects, meaning that people who save the money they spend on something else. That's just, you know, for instance, people in East Africa going by. Um, so the dollar just yeah just uh to clarify hike the dollar savings is based on dep says that a pound of nitrogen saved for is worth 500 dollars, and so that like i don't know if that would have that same carry on effect or not but i'd love to talk to you more about that and how to extend it yeah, and I do, I, 
I think these impacts, I think you're right that they are very conservative. Um, and that was just kind of the capacity of, of us and our little working team here. Um, but we also really emphasize that fertilizer free, you know, and so doing the soil test and fertilizing with phosphorus based on what your phosphorus levels currently are, of course, they're typically high throughout Florida and Central Florida. So um, we didn't really get into that in here, but that was a behavior change that we have in our data. Um, and of course, with water quality and Florida-friendly education, there's a lot of other behavior changes that we were encouraging and see. Um, we just don't have a way of really quantifying those. So we see this as a start to possibly quantifying other impacts. Thank you. Thank you.